I like I've said before, folks, if that doesn't put your wood on fire, then your wood's all wet, right? Amen. Amen. As we've announced over the last couple of weeks, and we are planning ahead on this, you say, wow, Brother Bobby, you got up early today to preach. That's right. And if the good Lord willing and the creek don't rise, we're going to be through with the sermon by 11.15. Why? Because we have a very important and exciting, as you've already been told, called business meeting to have as a church family to discuss what I think are some very exciting immediate needs, but also to start looking ahead to some future needs that I believe are very exciting here at South Fork Country Church. I mentioned a few moments ago that in next month, believe it or not, next month will be our 35th anniversary as a church. I decided not to take them off the wall, but if you would like to before you leave today, or any Sunday for that matter, in my office, the pastor's office, if you walk in on the left-hand wall as you walk in, are three pictures framed in gold, and it gives some history of our church. Let me share some of that history with you. Some of you have asked, or you may be wondering, when in the world did our church start? How did this church start? Well, in 1986, our history says, Bill Burge, manager of the South Fork Mobile Home Park, said and put forth the idea of a South Fork mission starting at the park. He mentioned the park's existence to the Reverend John Max Cox, pastor then of the First Baptist Church in Murphy, and together with uh, Pastor Cox, along with Reverend Julia Stagner, pastor Murphy Baptist uh, Church, and the Reverend A.L. Draper of First Baptist Church Wiley, the three of those pastors and churches decided to work together to co-sponsor the mission that is now South Fork Country Church. The three churches met and called the Reverend George Fournay, I think I pronounced that correct, to become the first pastor, the mission pastor of South Fork at that time. In September 1986, do the math, 35 years, right? The first services were held at South Fork Mobile Home Park. Well, as time went on, in the early 90s, they began putting a plan in place to relocate. They got this piece of property here. At the time, I think we had nine acres or something like that in the beginning. We have six acres here right now. We still have six acres. But they brought in a group of people known as the Texas Baptist Builders, men and women who come in. And, and one of the pictures back there, if you'll look before you leave on the table, shows their they're motorhomes. They bring them in, trailers or RVs, and they live in those, their RVs, uh, while they're building a church. And they do this all over Texas. Other states have similar uh, mission teams. But Texas, folks, we are Baptists to the core in that regard, amen, built by Baptist building builders who volunteer their time and work. But on February the 5th, 1995, okay, nine years after the church started approximately, South Fork Baptist Church then, we're still Baptist, but Baptist was in the name then, held their dedication service for this building. So if you've ever wondered how long we've been in this building, the answer is it was dedicated on February 5, 1995. So what's that, 26 years? Give or take. That's our starting point, right? If you watched any of the Olympics a few weeks ago, any of the track and field, every, every running event had a start, didn't it? Where they, they kneel down or hunker down and someone fires a starting pistol and off they go, right? Well, our starting pistol, if you will, was in September 1986. And guess what? We're still running, amen? We're still running. In my six years or so here, and Brother Jim's even longer than that, the church has talked many times about needing to do things. And we've had some very faithful people who have maintained our property. Had, they've had project after project to, to repair things and, 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 and re remodel in some, in some cases in different places in small ways. But we've come to the point now we really do need to take some bigger steps in remodeling some things, repairing some things, 
and doing some things that we've talked about doing for a long time, but just never, uh, you know, jumped to the decision to do it. Well, it's time we do that. We can't keep talking about it. Talking's not getting it done. We need to move forward with some very important but exciting plans, which we'll talk about at our business meeting. But in preparation for that today, I want to talk about a story in the Bible in the book of Nehemiah. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. If you find First or Second Kings, keep going to the right a little bit. Then you'll find First and Second Chronicles. Keep going to the right a little bit more. It's sometimes kind of hard to find some of those books. But then you're going to find Nehemiah after Ezra, okay? Ezra, then you're going to find Nehemiah. Now, time does not allow us to, to get really deep into a lot of what Nehemiah has because it's a, it's a you know, rather lengthy book. But the gist of Nehemiah is this. And let me share some Old Testament Bible history with you, okay? We know that the Jews completed the temple in Jerusalem in 516 B.C., okay? The temple was built. It was magnificent, right? But the walls... The wall around the city of Jerusalem and the gates in which you would enter into the city had never really been completed or maintained like they should have been. Kind of like some church houses, right? We build them just like this one was built and, and dedicated in 1995. But as time goes on, wear and tear, the need for more improvements, the need for more things comes along. And that's what we see in the story of Nehemiah as he led a group of people in an incredible fashion. Today we're going to talk specifically about remodeling and rebuilding the gates into the city of Jerusalem. Now you should have received, uh, along with your bulletin, a handout that's got some of the gates listed. Do you see that there? Everybody have a copy of that that was in your bulletin? Yeah. Just, uh, you can take a look at that. We're not going to get into that in detail today. Time wouldn't allow. However, on our Wednesday night Bible study in a few weeks, we're going to talk about the gates of Jerusalem because it's a magnificent story. The symbolism, the, the meaning behind these gates is absolutely incredible. But just imagine, you're in the city of Jerusalem. The temple is the focus there in the city, okay? And you can see where the temple is indicated on the map there near the top. Well, folks, they always had to worry about the enemy coming and causing problems, right? So they would build a wall around the city, literally a fortress to keep the enemies out. Well, you had to be able to get into the city, right? So you had to have gates that you could open and close like a door into the walled city. And even still today, folks, if you travel to Jerusalem... There's still the wall around the old city. Sure, they have to maintain it and, and keep it repaired from time to time, but there are so many sections of the wall, some below ground level now because of time and, and building up, if you will, that's original. They can date it back to the original. It's absolutely incredible. But even still today, the old city of Jerusalem has the wall around it. You can walk around it, and it's, it's amazing. Well, Nehemiah heard that the wall and the gates around his Favorite city. As a Jewish guy, he said, you know what? I've heard reports the wall and the gates have been neglected. They're not being refurbished, not being kept up, not being worked on when they need to be worked on. They're deteriorating. We no longer have a fortress to keep the enemy at bay. Our neglect is showing that maybe our hearts aren't where they need to be, Nehemiah was thinking and saying. He went to his king of whom he was the cupbearer for, and said, I need permission to go to my, basically to go to my hometown, right? Go back to Jerusalem and help them rebuild the wall and the gates. The Persian king gave Nehemiah permission to go back to Jerusalem to do this project Nehemiah felt God calling him to do. And so the Bible says that Nehemiah did indeed. Look in your Bible in the book of Nehemiah for just a moment. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. This is Nehemiah speaking, right? So the king asked me, Nehemiah, why does your face look so sad? And you're not even sick. This can be nothing but sadness of heart. 
I was very much afraid, Nehemiah says. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried, my hometown, right, he's saying, my hometown of Jerusalem lies in ruins. Now, folks, our property is not lying in ruins, but you're going to hear in a few moments, there are some things we need to do. We'll talk about that today. The gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Nehemiah says, I prayed to God. God gave him direction. God gave Nehemiah guidance. God said to Nehemiah, this is what you need to do, Nehemiah. And Nehemiah says to King Arderictes, he says, if it pleases the king and your servant has favor in his sight, let him, the king, send me to the city of Judah, back to Jerusalem, where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. I can rebuild it. Folks, the city wall in many ways represented God's protection upon the city. And it certainly and literally provided protection from their enemy. So the wall was important. Physically, militarily, spiritually, emotionally. That protection is there. You feel safe when you go to bed at night. But the wall and the gates had not been maintained. Now take your bulletin and look at the outline for what I want us to talk about for the rest of our time this morning. And this is one of those subjects I could preach a whole six-part sermon series on Nehemiah alone, and I will someday. But today what I want us to talk about, as you see on your outline on the back of your bulletin, it'll also pop up on the screen, I imagine. Look what it says on the back of your bulletin. Jerusalem in the time of Nehemiah shows ten gates. And if you look at the uh, little picture I gave you in your bulletin, you can count them, there are ten there, okay? Now, don't get confused with the gates in Nehemiah's day with the gates in New Testament days, because there's a difference in some of the gates, okay? This is about, uh, Nehemiah lived in about, what, 540? This, this story of Nehemiah is taking place in about 540 B.C. Well, going into New Testament days, some of the uh, gates change some of the names change okay these are the gates in nehemiah's day due to time battle wear and tear etc there was a need for a lot of repair work that wasn't being done well south fork has come to a time in our beloved history 35 years next month where we need to take and make some important and necessary but exciting decisions about our property and our future so let's approach these needs with prayer, excitement, joy, and commitment. And then look at the outline, the lesson for today. How God calls His people to work together. Number one, God calls His people. Specifically, now we're talking about us, okay? Our lesson is from Nehemiah. We see the examples in the book of Nehemiah in this story today. But I want us to talk about ourselves as well. He calls us to work together here at South Fork by making His glory the focus. And that's why I specifically wanted to pray earlier today that what we do as a church, what we do as individual Christians is done for the honor and glory of God. Amen? That is our ultimate purpose. It's not for any of us to have glory heaped upon. Our goal is to bring honor to His holy name. We can work together to bring glory to God's holy name. Look at number two. God calls His people to work together by using ordinary people, okay? And folks, you know what? There's no one more ordinary than me, okay? You know, most of you know my story, right? You know, I grew up in a small town up in uh, North Texas, northeast of Amarillo, right? I'm as ordinary as people, as a person can be, Okay? And maybe you feel the same way about yourself. But you know what I've learned over the years? God can use ordinary people. Amen? Amen? It doesn't matter what your education level is, what your financial status is, what your job status is. It doesn't matter what your, what your background is. If you commit yourself to the Lord, and then as a group of people making up a church family, as we commit ourselves to the Lord, God can do great things through us. Amen? He certainly can, and He wants to. By using ordinary people. Now, I know what we think because I think this sometimes too. We can start thinking to ourselves, well, who am I 
that God could use me. You ever thought that? I'm just a nobody. Well, folks, look back in your Bible in the book of Nehemiah again. We see example after example, name after name in the book of Nehemiah of people that God brought together to rebuild these gates. Again, imagine, if you will, he's got this big stone wall, okay, that's built to keep the enemy at bay, to keep the bad guys out of Jerusalem, okay, to keep the enemy out. Well, you have to be able to get in and out, right? So you have these gates. And if you'll hang with me over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about these gates. They're very symbolic, very spiritual meanings behind all of the gates, okay? Um, but you had to be able to get in and out, right? Some of the gates, depending on what part of the city they were in, had a specific purpose. But they were all basically to ingress and egress, right? In and out. In and out. Well, look at Nehemiah. We see that God brought Nehemiah together, and he did a masterful job of organizing the people, organizing the work, motivating the people, letting them know just how important the task at hand was. And folks, again, we don't have time to go through much of this, but look back in Nehemiah, look back around, um, oh, pick up in verse... Uh, we we'll go back to chapter 7. In chapter 7, you're going to see a long list of people listed there. Ordinary people, like me and you. Names are in the Bible. People God loves, right? And then as we look on into chapter 9, you'll see a, another list. You'll see different names listed. Chapter 10, you're going to see a long list of people. Look at chapter 10, for example. You see a long list of people that God was using within the city to be involved in the work. And on and on it goes. Verse 28, chapter 10, for example, says, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring prophets got together. The work was to be done. Listen, today we're going to hear some exciting opportunities and some exciting needs that need to be taken care of as a church family. And let's never, ever let the devil make us think, by golly, if God wants us to do that, I'm not sure if we can. <laughs> Instead, what are, we, what are we supposed to think? If God wants us to do it, we can do it. We may be ordinary folk, but we can do whatever God wants us to do. Amen? Amen. Listen, God is king. And if God wants us as a church to do something, I know without a doubt we can get her done, right? Amen. Look at number three on the list. Not only do we work together by making God's glory and His, uh, His presence the focus, He uses ordinary people, He d unites diverse people, all right? God, as He uses those of us, we're all different, He unites us, right? I mean, and just think about... Uh, Think about our church. Think about the people that make up South Fork Church right now. I mean, looking across the room, those that are here, we've got several who couldn't come today. But we all have different jobs. Or if you're retired, we all had a different job at some point, right? We all live in different houses. We drive different cars. Our family situation is different. Some of you have uh, maybe no children. Maybe you have one child or a bunch of kids. Some may have no grandkids. Some have a bunch of grandkids. We're all different, right? We're diverse. We all look different. There's not two people in this room that look alike. No, we're diverse. We're different, right? And that's number three on the list. God calls His people to work together by uniting our diversity. The old saying, we're stronger together, is so true. We're stronger together. And if we will commit our hearts to prayer and to work and to serve and to support what God wants our church to do, with what we'll talk about today and what is to come in the future, I know without a doubt we can get it done. People ask me all the time uh, something like this. They'll say, uh, Bobby or Pastor, do you think God can do, you fill in the blank, right? Do you think God can do this? Bobby, do you think God can do that? You know what my answer always is? Absolutely, God can do anything God wants to do. Amen? He created us. He created this universe. And as our church 
through our leadership team, puts together whatever plan the Holy Spirit will give to us today and in the future. If you ask me, Pastor, can God do that? My answer will be with a big smile on my face. Yes, He can. Amen? We've all seen God do amazing things. Why not let God continue? And maybe even more so, do amazing things at South Fork Church in the future. Amen? Look at number four. God calls His people to work together also by calling us to work and commit. By calling us to work and commit. You know, we have so many faithful people here that are so faithful to uh, maintain as we've been maintaining and, and repairing as repairs need to be done and so on and so forth. Uh, teaching classes, helping with the music ministry. I mean, so many of you are so faithful in so many different ways. But today, in just a few moments as we get into our business meeting, you're going to hear about some things that need to be done that, uh, that we just can't do internally. We'll talk about that today. And as we look to the future and get excited about what God wants us to do in the future, it'll take a commitment. And that's why this number four is so important. He calls us to make a commitment sometimes. Sometimes that commitment might be just to pray about something. Now, a lot of us, we talk about praying, but a lot of us don't really do much praying, do we? Can you imagine for just a moment if every single one of us and others who are part of the church who aren't here today, those are watching online, if we not only said we would, but what could God do if we really, every single day, hey, even for five minutes to start with, prayed for our church, prayed that God's Holy Spirit be upon this church to the extent that great things couldn't help but happen. What do you think would happen? I think great things would happen, don't you? Start praying for your church, okay? Please pray for your church. We can work and commit through prayer by getting involved in a way that maybe we haven't been involved before. What is that? Well, again, that could be anything that needs to be done. Fill in the blanks, right? Today, you're going to be hearing about some work that needs to be done soon. And thank the good Lord above. We have some funds available already for that. And that's a blessing because of your giving up to this point already. And the stewardship that our church has been uh, adhering to in the past. But you're also going to hear about some things that are going to take a wee bit more commitment when the time is right. Now those things haven't been ironed out yet. But we're planting the seed today, okay? South Fork Country Church 2.0. Move forward in faith, amen? But it's not going to happen if we don't commit to do the work that needs to be done. We all know that. Whether it's your job that you have or the job that you may have retired from. You know, Going to work and getting a paycheck doesn't just happen on its own, does it? No. You've got to get up, get ready, and go to work and put the work in. The same is true at church. And I know sometimes it's easy to come and sit and soak at church, right? Well, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm on a fixed income. This, those are all legitimate statements. I get it. None of us are as young as we used to be, right? Uh, I've got bad hips, bad knees, and a bad back, folks. I'm the triple whammy, okay? Uh, yeah, we're all, we're all getting older, right? And listen, finances are, are, are tough for all of us. I understand that. But work and commitment. You keep asking yourself, what does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? And then number five, recording the names. Um, look, uh, look in Nehemiah one more time. We're just about done. Look in uh, chapter 3. I like this. Look in Nehemiah chapter 3. In Nehemiah chapter 3, it talks about those that were building the wall and involved in rebuilding these gates that needed to be done. And again, time doesn't allow me to go through here and really spend a lot of time doing this. This would be a good devotional for you this week sometime. Take time, Nehemiah 3. Just read through Nehemiah and look at all the names. I mean... Verse, chapter 3, verse 1 talks about those that rebuilt the sheep gate, one of those ten gates on that little map thing you have there. 
There's name after name after name after name after name after name in chapter 3. What does each name represent? Someone that committed their time, their energy, their effort, their resources to rebuilding the gates and some of the walls around the city of Jerusalem. Folks, the comparison is so perfect. No, we don't have gates and walls like they had around the city of Jerusalem, but folks, we have some physical needs here at this church place. Now listen, the church is the people, I understand that, but this building is the representation of our Lord, right, of our church here at South Lord. This last commitment, this number five, is something I want you to be thinking about. Now today, with our immediate concerns, as I mentioned, as you'll hear today, we have funds available. But there will come a time, and I'm excited about this, and I will be the first, Susan and I will be the first ones. We're gonna, we'll make a commitment when that time comes, I promise you, over and above our regular tithe. There will be a time in the future, if God continues to lead us on in the way that your leadership team wants the church to move forward, where we're going to have to make, make a commitment, a financial commitment, along with our prayer and positive attitude type commitments, okay? You know, sometimes you can't do anything but do what? You can, at some point, you've got to pull out the old wallet and pull out the cash and lay it down and say, I'm making a commitment, right? Yeah. Well, we're thankful that God blesses us and He's going to continue to bless this church in that regard. I just want to plant the seed. You know, before you can grow tomato plants, you've got to plant the seed, right? Anything, you've got to plant the seed first. You nurture it, you water it, take care of it. And then you get to reap the harvest when the tomatoes start growing. And nothing better in, in the world than a vine-ripe tomato. Amen? Puts the tomatoes at the grocery store to shame, okay? <laughs> if, you know what, if you've eaten a vine-ripe tomato, you know what I'm talking about. But it started with the seed, right? Today we're planting some seeds at South Fork Church. And at some point, if we follow the Lord, stay committed, the fruit's going to bloom, amen? The blessings are going to come. As we move into our time of commitment today, now here's what I want you to do, first of all, if you would. Just in your own way, say, Lord, I'm not exactly sure what my commitment looks like right now, but Lord, I'm going to make a commitment to my church through you to do whatever I can do to see that the ministry of South Fork continues and even grows, Lord, in the days to come. Just make that commitment, all right? Here's something else I'm going to throw out today because we have the baptisms coming up Thursday. At the, at the Shin's house for uh, Anthony and, and Heather, okay? Some of you are here, and maybe you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. You may have accepted Christ as Savior already. For that, I say praise the Lord. But maybe you haven't followed the Lord through with believer's baptism. In just a few moments, as we have our invitation time, I'm going to be sitting right down here. I'll put my mask back on. Come and sit next to me and say, Pastor, I want to be baptized Thursday night. You may have been baptized before, but maybe, maybe you weren't sure if you were a Christian at that point. Or maybe, maybe there's just been some things in your life that have occurred since your baptism. You think, man, I would like to do that again. I know it doesn't save me. I know it doesn't get me into heaven. I know it's just a, a beautiful picture of the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord. But by golly, I want to do it again. Amen. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? I've been baptized four times, all right? Uh, and the reason I say four times, uh, when I was a young boy, where the church I actually got saved in, the community church in Skellytown, and then the first Baptist church, when I joined the Baptist church, my brother and I got baptized together. And then I've been baptized twice in the Jordan River in Israel, okay, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, so, you know, we have a baptistry here, but there's a lot of technical and, and mechanical problems with it, so we've opted over the years. It's just not really feasible to fix at this point. We've used the wire pull a few times, and we're so thankful to the, sh to the shins for this week. So think about that. Now listen, you may not know today if you want to do that call me call me or brother jim this week look at the bulletin my phone number our phone numbers are there. call me say bobby i want to be baptized thursday night and whatever questions you have I'll walk, I'll walk through it with you okay but i would love if that happens for others in our church family pray with me heavenly father we thank you lord of the story and the message behind nehemiah and lord we just barely scratched the surface of nehemiah today Lord, barely scratched the surface. What an amazing job you led him to do through your spirit. And Father, for our 
sake today, Lord, as we make the application. Father, we don't have gates and walls, but Father, we have other needs here at our church. And Father, we need to all join together and work together and pray together and commit together, Lord, to make your will happen, to follow you faithfully. So Father, we pray for this meeting to come today and for whatever the future holds in this regard. And now, Father, I pray for those in this building today. I pray for those watching online. Lord, for anyone who may not have yet accepted you as Lord and Savior. God, that is my main hope today. My main goal, Lord, is that someone would accept you as Savior today, Lord, to have the promise of salvation and the promise of heaven. Father, I pray for those that may want to follow through with baptism this Thursday night. Those who are watching online, Lord, those here in the church house, to let me know, let me and Brother Jim know, today or tomorrow or by, by Thursday, well, they want to they do that, to follow through with their commitment to you, Lord, with believers' baptism. And Father, we give this time of commitment to you. Lord, lead us and guide us as a church family. Father, light a fire under our hearts today to be excited about our faith, excited about you as our Savior, and excited about our church. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.